but I want to say uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. And I'd like to welcome you to Strengthening the Roles of International Courts and Tribunals at the 11th Annual Cambridge International Law Conference. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the chair for this session. Ms. Melina Antoniadis is a Canadian lawyer specializing in public international law and human rights. She has advised in proceedings before the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and the European Court of Human Rights. She has also held positions at the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. Ms. Antoniadis is currently a project attorney for Blue Ocean Law, providing assistance to the Republic of Vanuatu and its initiative to request an advisory opinion on climate change from the International Court of Justice. A member of the Law Society of Ontario, Ms. Antoniadis completed her training at the Crown Law Office Civil of, of the Ontario Ministry of the Attorney General. So without further ado, here's your chair. Hello everybody, um, and thank you very much for joining us here um, at our first panel. Um, we have a very exciting panel this morning, all of whom I'm sure have a great deal to say uh, about international courts and tribunals. Uh, I will briefly introduce the panelists who will speak for a period of 10 minutes. After each panelist has spoken, we will start with a discussion for about 20 minutes. The panelists have been sent advanced working drafts of the fellow panelists papers, and so you will be able to hear, hear them discuss each other's papers. Uh, then we will have a chance for a question and answer session at the end. Uh, with questions from you in the audience. So if you have a question, then please do write it into the chat with your name and where you're writing from. Um, and the great thing about this event uh, being online is that we're able to hear from people all around the world um, and hopefully many more than we would otherwise have in Cambridge. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to the first panelist, Ms. Uh, Nina Herzog, a PhD candidate at the University of Leeds. Uh, Nina holds an LLM in international law from the University of Leeds and a BA in political science and public law from the University of Greifswald in Germany. Nina will present her paper, Positive Complementarity, a Threat to NABIS in IDEM in International Criminal Law. Before I pass on to Nina, a reminder to all of the audience members to please write your questions uh, into the chat box. Nina, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Let me just quickly share my screen so we can get my presentation going. There we go. Um, good morning from Leeds, everyone, and thank you so much, Melina. Um, my paper examines the uh, principles of complementarity and navies in Eden and their relationship to each other. So it is argued that if both principles are being applied in real life cases, there appears to be a superior position of the complementarity principle which is negatively affecting the Navis and Eden principle. So um, just a quick outline. I'll be laying out the basics of Navis and Eden and complementarity before further diving into positive complementarity and then looking at the real life case of Katanga. So with the ICC being a permanent court at the international level, it does not have the primary jurisdiction over international crimes. This means that the ICC is not exclusively prosecuting international crimes falling within its jurisdiction, but rather complementarity to national courts. So with more than one legal system having jurisdiction over international crimes, one needs to ensure that the defendant's rights are protected, especially with, from the possibility of being tried twice for the same crime. So this is reflected in the principle Navies in Eden, which we will be looking at first. Navis and Edom is recognized in most national criminal justice systems, and it reflects the maxim that a person cannot be prosecuted or tried more than once for the same crime. So in the Rome statute, the principle can be found in Article 20. With the ICC operating in an international setting, the principle's functions vary from those in a domestic setting, where investigations and proceedings take place within the same jurisdiction likely with a clear hierarchy within this one system. So this means that in addition to the function of Navis and Edom as a protector or defender of human rights, Navis and Edom in the Rome Statute also fulfills the means um, of allocating jurisdictional competence. Um, quickly on the, the first function, uh, protecting human rights. Um, it, it stems from this idea of protecting defendants from state abuse, uh, 
Um, while this may only seem relevant on a domestic level, it also plays a part in, on the international level. So here it's more about a general abuse of legal power, um, but it would have the same effect. So we're trying to ensure that an individual isn't being tried more than once for the same. Um, in addition to this, Navis and Edom also provides finality to criminal proceedings, not only in the legal sense of res judicata, but it also entails a psychological aspect of finality for the defendant, who does not need to worry about being tried again. So this first function of Navis and Edom is rather similar to the domestic setting. The second function, however, is very unique to the ICC. So with more than one legal system being responsible for prosecuting international crimes, deciding who actually has jurisdiction over a case is not straightforward. So Navis and Edom therefore serves as an allocator of jurisdictional competence. This uh, is mainly relevant regarding Article 22 and 3, as Article 21 is only looking at possible retrials before the court following uh, an ICC decision. So for paragraphs two and three, the relationship between domestic courts and the ICC is displayed in the so-called vertical dimension. In this dimension, we have the upward and downward motion. The downward motion is concerning paragraph two, which states that no one shall be tried by another court for a crime according to article five, so core crimes, if that person has already been tried by the ICC. So here we're looking downwards from an ICC decision to domestic proceedings. The main issue regarding the downwards dimension is the crime element. So it only prohibits domestic prosecutions regarding the international core crimes, but states could simply change, for example, a former genocide charge to a murder charge under domestic law. And this change then would not fall under the Navy Seed and protection. Article 23 is then looking at the upward motion of the vertical dimension. So the possibility of um, subsequent proceedings before the ICC following domestic ones. Here, the connection between Navis and Eden and complementarity becomes clearer as paragraph three names exceptions. For example, the domestic proceedings were carried out for the purpose of shielding a person or that the proceedings just weren't carried out impartially. Now, moving on to complementarity. Complementarity is one of the admissibility criteria in the Rome Statute. The admissibility criterion in Article 17.1 A and B is limiting the ICC to proceedings where domestic states are unwilling or unable to investigate um, in either ongoing or completed domestic cases. So the close connection between complementarity and Navy Sweden becomes even more apparent when looking at Article 17.1 C, because here a direct reference to Navy Sweden and Article 23 is being made. So should a person have already been tried for conduct domestically, the ICC is barred from trying that person again under Article 20, Paragraph 3. So this rule is, however, only applying towards the downwards motion of the vertical, then, sorry, the downwards motion of the vertical dimension. Um, and it's not commenting on uh, the, the downwards motion and its effect on possible subsequent prosecutions on the domestic level. So when looking at the provision, it becomes quite clear that complementarity at the time of the drafting of the Rome Statute was understood as a mechanism through which the ICC only takes action where domestic courts fail to act. So this, so this idea of the ICC acting as a court of last resort. Um, now the idea of the ICC acting as a court of last resort and only stepping in where domestic jurisdictions fail um, has changed ever so slightly. In 2003, the OTP advocated for a more active role of the court by encouraging domestic governments to prosecute international crimes within the court's jurisdiction on a national level. So according to the OTP's understanding, complementarity sets out a system of judicial enforcement for the prosecution of the most serious international crimes at both the domestic and international level. So within this system, it is the ICC's responsibility to encourage and facilitate domestic states in prosecuting international crimes. Positive complementarity thus aims to encourage domestic criminal justice systems to conduct their own criminal proceedings. And in doing so, it offers a resource effective means to ending impunity. Now, there are, however, a few issues with this because cooperating too closely with domestic investigative authority 
poses the risk of the loss of neutrality and distance to objectively assess domestic proceedings according to Article 17. So with positive complementarity, understanding states and the ICC as collaborating and complementing each other's efforts to achieve the goal of ending impunity, other norms may actually find themselves on the sideline. Navis and Edom is one of them, as it will become clearer uh, in the case of Katanga we'll be looking at shortly. Um, thus, the balance between complementarity and Navis and Edom is not easily established. One could even go as far as saying that Navis and Edom is limited by complementarity, especially in its positive form. This makes clear that once again, Navis and Edom does not only act as a protector of human rights, but rather as a means to not only establishing jurisdiction, but maybe also allocating authority between the ICC and states by narrowing, uh, by being narrowed down uh, as, as far as possible in order to make room for state sovereignty. So by looking at the case of Katanga, the reasoning behind the ICC putting Navis and Edom on the sideline in order to retain state sovereignty will become clearer. So Katanga was convicted by the ICC in March 2014 for a crime against humanity and war crimes committed in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he was sentenced to a total of 12 years imprisonment. Now, less than one month after his transfer to a prison facility in the DRC in January 2016, he was said to be released. However, the DRC issued a, re issued a decision to refer alleging Katanga of numerous offenses between 2002 and 2006. In that decision, the DRC intends to conduct subsequent domestic prosecutions against Katanga, which were communicated to the ICC. Now, based on this, the ICC thought clarification of the legal consequences of this decision, making reference to the DRC's sovereignty and the principle of complementarity. The ICC noted that the Rome Statute does not expressively set out any relevant criteria regarding the prosecution of a sentenced person by a state. It further found that its purpose is not to replace national courts. Therefore, approval should only be denied when the protection, sorry, when the prosecution of sentenced persons may undermine certain fundamental principles of the Rome Statute. Now, this raises the question. Is Navis and Edom not a fundamental principle of the Rome Statute? Following the ICC's approval, Katanga unsuccessfully applied for reconsideration um, and he claimed violation of fair trial rights. Now, it's important to note that during this whole time, Katanga was still imprisoned and had received no information on the specific charges or evidence against him. Surprisingly, just last year in uh, March 2020, Katanga was released from Makala prison as a result of a peace agreement between the Congolese government and the FRPI, uh, which is a powerful armed group, which was once led by Katanga. Had it not been for this, Katanga would most likely still be in prison. Now, the way this case was handled by the ICC leaves room for improvement regarding the aftermath of an ICC sentence. So the main aim of the procedure between the ICC and states wanting to carry out prosecutions is the protection of a person who has served the sentence from prosecution within the enforcement state. Thus, the ICC should refuse authorization for subsequent prosecutions if the prosecution is politically motivated or likely violating Navies and Eden as set out in Article 22. So the question here is, would the prosecution by the DRC violate Article 22? Now, this is difficult to say as the DRC did not give any details regarding the alleged offenses. However, Article 22 only covers the same conduct. And in the case of Katanga, this conduct is only this one attack on the village um, on the 24th of February in 2003. So the DRC could thus prosecute any further crimes allegedly committed. The issue here is that by narrowing the context and timeframe of an ICC charge to a minimum, this narrows the Navies and Eden protection granted in the Rome Statute. But it's on the one hand, allowing uh, for a significant portion of state sovereignty in terms of domestic prosecution. But is lowering the safeguard for former defendants who have served or are currently serving their sentence in the name of state sovereignty really desirable? 
And does this in itself not affect the credibility and legitimacy of the card? So to quickly sum up, um, with the ICC's push towards positive complementarity, cases like Katanga are arguably more likely. By actively encouraging states to prosecute international crimes domestically, states might get over ambitious in their goal to ending impunity by investigating those individuals again for crimes which have already been dealt with by the ICC. So the main issue with these subsequent prosecutions in the name of, com of positive complementarity is its effect on other principles, namely Navis and Eden. As we've established earlier, Navis and Eden's functions in the Rome Statute is twofold. It means to allocate jurisdiction, but also a safeguard for defendants and thus a protector of human rights. So there clearly is a close connection, if not even interdependence, of the Rome Statute and human rights. By advocating for a more positive and proactive approach to complementarity, the ICC risk, risks possible breaches of the fundamental human right not to be tried twice for the same. Now this brings my presentation to an end and I'm looking forward to any questions or comments. Thank you, Nina, <clears throat> that was wonderful. Um, we're going to save the questions to the end, uh, but I'm sure there will be a few coming out of your presentation. So thank you very much for that. Um, before I pass on to our next speakers, uh, I wanted to clarify that each panelist has indeed 15 minutes and not 10 minutes uh, to present. Um, <clears throat> I'm now going to pass on uh, over to our next panelist. Welcome to Pushkar Keshav Murthy. Pushkar is an Indian qualified advocate enrolled at the Karnataka State Bar Council and an accredited uh, commercial mediator. At present, he is a case manager at the Mumbai Center for International Arbitration. His paper, uh, which was co-authored with Ms. Daniela, Daniela Olivia Gigayanu, is titled Security for Costs in Investor State Dispute Settlement is the Uncitral Working Group 3 Leading to the Predictable Global Governance of International Adjudication. Pushkar, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, before I start off my presentation, let me just share my screen. Uh, today, uh, in, in this August gathering, I would like to present one of the most pressing topics, which seems to be never ending for now, and that is security for costs in ISDS. It's quite controversial that states want this and the claimants do not want this. Now, I say this because when the whole world after the pandemic has been shifting towards pro-investment, states are being regressive again. Now, we need not go back to pre-1990 era, but in today's discussion, we would like to focus on what the UNCITRA Working Group 3 is doing to promote ISDS in the correct manner. Just to kickstart and to give you an overview of what I will be presenting today and also focusing in my paper. Firstly, let's look at what ISDS is as an international adjudicating system, following which we can look at the backlash against it, more specifically against the security for cost, and what the UNCITRAL Working Group 3 is doing generally, and more specifically on security for cost, and how best we could navigate further in promoting this as a global governance model. Starting off with who are the stakeholders in ISDS? Now we have foreign investors, multinational companies, states, entities, interestingly, civil societies, which is gaining traction these days. Now, one thing that is often missed out is the taxpayer, because the money for all this litigation and for all, all these arbitrations comes from the income taxpayers. So we need to consider their stakeholder nationality as well. Now, now that we know that investors in terms of the getting their reliefs done, we need to know that whether they can do this before the ICJ or before an international private tribunal. This is exactly what I saw. Professors, uh, some professors even from Cambridge are sitting as arbitrators, practitioners and experts. Now, we may all wonder why do all these people sit as adjudicators and not really 
uh, you know, you have standing body of judges. That's exactly one of the criticism that is being faced against the current ISTS system. Now, when we talk about the role of ISTS in the international identity system, so three main things is, is to be considered in promoting whether ISTS is really required or not. First thing, whether is it promoting foreign direct investment? If it is, consequently, is there an economical development of developing and undeveloped developed countries in the process of all these investments? Thirdly, whether ISDS in itself protects the legitimate interest of the investors community. We all know that investors community is being disgruntled, especially during the pandemic era, and it may continue to do so in the long run. Now, just to give some context of what the criticism is in terms of the current ISA system, of course, it is excessive cost, it's unlike the ICJ or the ICC. Now, all of this points out to one thing that the system is not transparent and there's no predictability in system. As you can see my screen, based on a recent study in 2019, the average cost which the claimant incurred in one proceeding on based on an approximate study was close to 6 million. Now the respond also is no less, even they face around 5 million US dollars. Now, we may not forget that we also have to end up paying the arbitrators or the adjudicators, which is close to a million dollar. Now, just imagine when a developing or an underdeveloped country goes to an arbitration against the they have to pay all of this, but they don't really have enough resources for poverty and other important pressing issues. Now, this is one of the main criticism why ISDS has become something to do with we don't want this anymore. Some of the prominent uh, uh, pro proponents or advocates of no ISDS is many senators from the US Congress as well. So this being the scenario, we need to consider whether if, if I, as a respondent state, go through the proceedings for almost 10 years and I win the case, but I don't recover all my 10 years of cost. Is it really worth the process? This is what I consider mainly in my paper, which I co-author with, with Daniela. And we consider what are the applicable tests for security for cost is. So when you want security for cost, you really apply to a tribunal, an application and state. I need a remedy in the interim because I don't really know whether the claimant will end up paying what I've incurred as losses. Now, for this, there's a classical test, which is uh, laid down in the manual versus uh, uh, Venezuela case, which I've quoted here. But this test, as we can see, is quite rigorous. It's not really applicable in all instances, because not every case is the same in terms of the applicable test for all four conditions to be satisfied. Now, this brings me to my next point, that is, what are these exceptional circumstances for which I, as a respondent state, can obtain all these remedies. Now, some of these points are given in some of the case laws uh, as recently held. Now, track record of payments. How do you check this? There's no mechanism to check someone's financial statements, especially if it's not in public domain. You can't really know whether the same party is funded by a third, third, third person or a third company. Now, all these things lead to one era of non-transparency. And this confidentiality regime is something that the ISTS has been backlashed against. In more particularly, security for cost, as I noted, has been given only in four out of the 75 publicly available decisions. Now, this trend has been increasing because all these days every respondent state is filing an application for security for cost but repeatedly they'll be rejected. Now, I mentioned the four cases where they have been awarded, but these four cases, interesting to note, the three of them were funded by a third party. Now, these exceptional circumstances is something that you cannot find in all cases. Now, this being the scenario, what is the Ancitra working group plea doing? Because as we can see, there are multiple reforms that the Ancitra working group is working on. But may I remind that this working group which started way back in 2017, got clarified in 2018 that they can only do procedural issues, not the substantive ones. Now, there is a limitation. Now, to overcome this limitation, 
Many states have come up with their multiple proposals as to how best this ISGS could be reformed. Now, most of these reforms which have been suggested right now, we don't really know whether they're under the scope of the working group three's mandate. Now, there is an uncertainty even till date, and we'll never know until 2025 when the mandate will get over. But my question really is, if at all we're waiting for till 2025, the process will start in 2017. Now that's a good eight years gap. And all the applications that have been filed in this period, they have no guidance whatsoever. Now, this being the scenario and this being the case where there's uncertainty looming around, it is interesting to note in the January 2020 secretarial note, there were multiple suggestions which the secretarial note suggested for the delegation. The delegation here, is the respondent says again. So it's really the case where the respondents are cribbing about it and the response are the same people who are also implementing these reforms. In this background, there are certain multiple things which are, which are briefly mentioned in the slide as well. First of it is whether the same relief is also available for the claimants. Now, I don't want to go into all these details because I also see that my time is running short before which I pass on the floor to my co-panelists who will take it forward from here. Hello, thank you very much. Daniel. Can you hear me? Okay, um, thank you very much and good morning. Um, yeah, so continuing on what Pushkar was saying about the UN Central Working Group, group 3, um, as, you, as we know, in January 2020, um, the, the, the working group considered some remedies which were, were needed because of the, because the security for, for cost should have been considered as equally for, for claimants. And the tribunal could consider the, the security for cost uh, without the request from, from any party, which is very important also from a state perspective. Um, but not, not only from the state, also as an investor, you need to give assurance uh, to, to the tribunal and also to, uh, to the respondent state. Um, also, whether considering the, uh, the security for cost that would be mandatory in some certainties and in some cases uh, involving the third party funding, that's an important, an important aspect. Uh, another problem which was seen by the by the working group was the non-compliance uh, in case of uh, or of the orders, um, which ended in suspension or termination of the proceedings, and that is very important um, also because if a part if a party that doesn't comply with um, a procedural order from a tribunal, this also affects justice and due process. So um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll change the slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, at, at the last session of the UNC trial group, group work three, the delegation of states um, considered that there is a, a relevant importance in security for costs. And indeed they suggested a model clause to be included and to be considered as a, as a tool, as an instrument uh, for, for the future, uh, especially because it, it's, a, it's of primary importance um, to be available for both claimants uh, and respondents, but especially for respondents for states against claimants, which at the end of the proceedings of long proceedings might be in default or, or even might not, might not exist. Um, but also to clarify the fact that uh, those security for costs will be available only at the request of, of one party. Um, and at the end, it was suggested that the respective clause should cover conditions and, and thresholds spe to specify co consequences um, in case of failure. Lastly, um, I see that something happened with the, with the presentation. Um, lastly, since the, since the working group three, 
uh, reform, some proposal, uh, some proposals made the day and uh, in for 2025, we, in our paper, we came up with some recommendations, which you will find in our final article. But I think we consider that it's very important to have uh, guidelines and to have draft guidelines and then those to be endorsed by the member of the UN Central, uh, especially on security for costs and also an enforceability of a standalone code, um, which we thought to be draft code of conduct, conduct for adjudicators in ASDS. And a second, uh, okay. And the second um, recommendation that we would have to be, it refers to enhanced transparency of the regime uh, because the claimant we consider should be obligated to disclose every time when a third party funder is involved. Who is the third party funder? Because the state and the taxpayers, they also need to, to know uh, how, in case the, the state wins, how the state will recover uh, the costs. And that being said, we finished our presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you both. That was, uh, that was great and very interesting indeed. Um, next, I will be handing over to Dr. Agata Kleckskowska, Assistant Professor at the Institute of Law Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Dr. Kleskowska is a member of the legal expert pool of the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats and of the ILA study group on the role of cities in international law. Dr. Kleskowska will be discussing her paper, Enforcing International Law Through Sanctions, From Comprehensive to Horizontal Sanctions. Is international law heading in the right direction? Over to you, doctor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no, we can't. Oh, yes, yes, we can see okay. it now. Wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, so through, throughout the years, sanctions turn out to be uh, the most broadly applied measures to enforce compliance with international law by the wrongdoing states. Uh, they became an important tool of global governance exercised through international law, even if their critique was and is still very vivid. Uh, since I didn't have much time, uh, I will proceed immediately to the first part of my presentation, uh, when I would like to discuss the development from comprehensive sanctions through targeted sanctions ending up on the horizontal sanctions. So comprehensive sanctions were usually adopted in reaction to crises occurring in particular states and uh, as indicated in its name, they cover the entire state's territory. The most characteristic examples uh, of country specific sanctions is the trade embargo imposed on a, a particular state. Uh, the three especially notable examples of comprehensive sanctions uh, occurred in the 90s and include measures undertaken against Iraq, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and Haiti. Uh, I would like to focus now on the Iraqi case. Uh, sanctions were the consequence of the invasion started by Iraq against Kuwait uh, on 2nd August uh, 1990. 
On the very same day, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 660, um, which uh, demanded uh, immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Since Iraq did not comply with these demands, on 6 August 1990, the UN Security Council uh, adopted a uh, resolution Oh, sorry, uh, adopted resolution 661 uh, uh, under the third paragraph uh, of this resolution, uh, states were prevented inter alia from importing into their territories of all commodities and products originating in Iraq or Kuwait, exported therefrom after the date of the resolution, and the only exceptions to these measures were supplies intended strictly for medical purposes and in humanitarian circumstances foodstuff. Uh, in mid 90s, it turned out that the humanitarian impact of comprehensive sanctions, especially on civilian population, may be devastating. Uh, that is why the international community started to gradually substitute comprehensive sanctions with the so-called targeted or smart sanctions, called precision guided munition of economic statecraft. Um, they may target both individuals as well as non-state entities and at the same time mitigate the impact of measures in the civilian population. The idea behind targeted sanctions is that they are designed to hurt elite supporters of the targeted regime while imposing minimal hardship on the mass public. Uh, the catalog of smart sanctions includes travel bans, asset freezes, uh, armed embargoes, capital restraints, foreign aid reductions and trade restrictions. Uh, one of the first uh, targeted sanctions uh, were those imposed against the UNITA in Angola by Resolution 1173. The UN Security Council undertook um, the following measures. Uh, it decided that uh, all states uh, shall require all persons and entities within their own territories holding uh, funds or financial resources to freeze them and ensure that they are not made available directly or indirectly to or for the benefit of UNITA as an organization or of senior officials of UNITA. And also decided that all states uh, shall take the necessary measures uh, to prohibit the sale or supply to persons or entities in areas of Angola to which state administration has not been extended of equipment used in mining or mining services and to prohibit um, also uh, the import of export of motorized vehicles or watercraft or spare parts of such vehicles or grant or waterborne transportation services. On the other hand, horizontal sanctions represent a further step in the evolution of the targeted sanctions. Uh, they reflect the targeted approach even more faithfully, make it more difficult uh, for uh, blacklisted individuals to claim that foreign powers seek to hurt the population with sanctions, and they address different situations which uh, many uh, may be labeled as surprises. Under horizontal sanctions, individuals are detached from uh, their state of nationality or residence. Thus, individuals responsible for specific violations may be blacklisted without pointing out the state's leadership, which constitutes undoubtedly an important advantage. What follows, they also do not require attribution of the violation of law to the state apparatus, but only to individuals. Horizontal sanctions may target uh, practices of local, foreign, or transnational enterprises operating in the zones of an armed conflict or on the territory of entities which say to it questioned, corruption schemes, or human rights violations. Uh, one of the most prominent examples of horizontal sanctions is the regime adopted under the U.S. Global Magnitsky Act, which inspired similar legislations also inter alia in uh, Canada and in the U.K., and the U.S. Global Magnitsky Act was also an inspiration for the EU Global Human Rights Sanctions Regime, which was uh, adopted on 7 December 2020. Uh, EU Global Human Rights Sanctions Regime uh, applies to, as uh, you can see, uh, international crimes as well as the most horrifying violations of uh, human rights. And nevertheless, uh, there is no corruption mentioned. So uh, and, and even though it was inspired by the Global Magnitsky Act, corruption was not included. Uh, under the EU regime, uh, sanctions may be imposed against natural or legal persons, entities or bodies who are responsible for one of these acts that I have just uh, displayed, who provide financial, technical or material support uh, for or are, or are otherwise involved in these acts, including by planning, directing, ordering, assisting, preparing, facilitating or encouraging such acts, 
or who are associated with the natural or legal persons, entities, or bodies covered uh, in point A or B. Uh, as for today, EU global human rights sanctions regime was applied twice. For the first time, it was on 18 January 2021. With regard to the tension uh, of uh, uh, the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny uh, upon his return to Moscow on 17 January 2021. And the second time it was used on it was the 22nd March 2021 when sanctions were adopted uh, due to the large scale arbitrary detentions of, in particular, Uyghurs in China, repressions in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances in Libya, torture and repressions against LGBTI persons and political opponents in Chechnya, and torture, extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions and killings in South Sudan and Eritrea. So now I would like to move to the second part of my presentation, uh, which concerns the critique of sanctions and the charges which are uh, often raised uh, against sanctions. So let me start with probably the most rudimentary one, that is the lack of effectivity of sanctions. After the phase wave of economic sanctions that took place in the 60s and 70s, uh, researchers came to the conclusion that economic sanctions are not that effective as military sanctions. In the 80s, this view started to change. Uh, policymakers and scholars claimed that sanctions were undermined uh, due to the overattention to a handful of famous failures, like Example, Gratia sanctions imposed on uh, Cuba since the 60s. Uh, the proponents of this new approach to sanctions agreed that sanctions have their limits and are not always effective, but by large, they are in uh, an efficient instrument for achieving important political goals. Uh, then in uh, 1985, the study by uh, Gary Clyde, uh, Hofbauer, Jeffrey J. Scotch, and Kimberly and Elliot is published. Uh, they examined sanctions from 1941 up to 1990, in total 115 sanctions, and came to the conclusion that sanctions were successful in 34% of cases, so much more than expected. They examine success by analyzing five factors, modest change in the target state behavior, destabilization of the target government, disruption of a minor um, military adventure, impairing of the military potential of a targeted state, and major changes in target state policies. However, the results of this research were challenged by Robert A. Pape, who, using the database of sanctions created by Hufbauer, Scotch, and Elliot, came to the conclusion that sanctions were successful in less than 5% of cases. He claimed that in general, the mistake made by the three researchers was that they expected that economic punishment can overwhelm a state commitment to pursue important policy goals. Uh, on the other hand, he measured uh, the sanctions using three criteria. Uh, the target conceded to a significant part of the coercer's demands. Economic sanctions were threatened or actually applied before the target changes behavior. Uh, and no more credible explanation exists for the target change of behavior. I will not analyze uh, in details these two studies. I leave it to, for you to decide which one is more accurate and close to the genuine mechanism of sanctions. Uh, I think I would say that the second one. Um, nevertheless, um, recent studies uh, about sanctions are much more descriptive, uh, pointing out only what traits, what factors uh, make sanctions effective or ineffective. Uh, so. What makes sanctions effective? I prefer the brief guide to effective sanctions. So first of all, don't be overambitious. Sanctions are more effective in achieving moderate and unarticulated goals. Don't get distracted. Sanctions should be focused on those responsible for violations of international law. Civilians first. Remember about establishing humanitarian exceptions, which will take over the burden of sanctions from the civilians. Act together. Sanctions are most effective when they are applied multilaterally, not unilaterally. Punish your enemies heavily, punish your friends heavier. Sanctions are the most effective against friendly nations that are politically and economically tied with the state or states that impose sanctions. In case of enemies, sanctions can stiffen their position. Now I would like to move to the second um, charge against sanctions, which is often raised, um, namely uh, the impact on civilian population. As I mentioned, uh, many sanctions are deemed ineffective. It is sometimes claimed that if sanctions were indeed effective, they would constitute a huge burden for the civilian population. But this statement does not seem to be accurate as also those sanctions which are described as ineffective 
often substantially deteriorate the situation of civilians. While it is true that the most vulnerable groups of society are certainly the most affected by sanctions in case of heavier measures, such as trade embargo, all strata of population suffer without exceptions. Uh, this statement is easy to demonstrate if to look at the description of living conditions in Iraq. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there was the trade embargo imposed on Iraq in the 90s. And the state, uh, before that, the state was pictured as a high middle income country with, with a modern social infrastructure. Its medical services and public health system were well developed, life expectancy amounted to 67 years, so comparable to Mexico or Brazil, while nearly all residents of cities and 72% of rural residents had access to clean water. The sanctions dramatically uh, degraded these conditions as they led to food shortages, lack of medicines and the clean drinking water, life mortality rose, and the health system totally collapsed. In the past, it was often claimed that too many humanitarian exemptions may create considerable loopholes in sanctions regimes, which in turn would make them ineffective. Uh, nevertheless, sanctions must take into account the basic needs and living conditions of the state population. Uh, thus, as the case of targeted and horizontal sanctions uh, also demonstrated, it is far better to have the sanctions which from the outset are directed against only those who violate international law, while the rest of the society, including the most vulnerable groups, is not affected by sanctions at all. Uh, obviously, the cartoon does not illustrate the sanctions imposed on Iraq, but uh, on Cuba. I didn't find uh, any on Iraq, but I guess it's anyway a good illustration uh, that um, sanctions uh, usually affect uh, regular people, uh, civilian people, and not the ones against which they are really targeted, the state officials. And now I would like to address the um, last charge um, uh, that is made against sanctions. Uh, so um, that sanctions are a tool that powerful states use against the weaker states. Uh, before I will get a question in Q&A, which states are those powerful and which are the weak ones? Uh, I am aware that I'm using obscure language, uh, but please just treat it as a shortcut instead of uh, repeating the description of the states all the time. Uh, let's assume that powerful states are those which have more than $50,000 uh, uh, of GDP per capita, have more than 2% of a share of global export of goods, um, are members of some decision-making organs, international decision-making organs, and are able to easily build multilateral coalitions. Uh, weaker ones uh, are simply those which uh, fail to meet these parameters. So this is one of the most frequently raised charges against sanctions, not only in the doctrine of law, but first and foremost in the public uh, opinion discourse. Actually, I agree with this charge, and I find the following arguments to support its accuracy. Uh, first of all, the powerfulness of some states uh, is often measured uh, by their strong economy and international economic ties. Thus, they man maintain economic ties with other states, influencing their economies through international trade. If they decide to introduce embargo on some kind of products or break economic ties with economically weaker states, the latter will surely feel the consequences of such policy. This impact will be even tougher when powerful states decide to act multilaterally since as I already stated, they, that makes the sanctions more effective. To put it differently, economic sanctions imposed by powerful states and weaker ones will be a genuine punishment for the latter ones. On the other hand, imagine the reverse situation when example Rakhia Bangladesh uh, imposes economic sanctions against the USA, for instance, because the USA tolerates violations of human rights of uh, workers in Bangladesh committed by American companies. Sanctions will be obviously ineffective and potentially it will harm only Bangladesh itself. Uh, secondly, the structure of international collective system allows powerful states to decide about sanctions. Look at the UN. It is the UN Security Council which decides about the binding sanctions. Obviously, there is 10 members of the UN Security Council chosen in a rotating system, so also weaker states can become part of this organ. Uh, but these are five permanent members which hold this capture. Uh, without their consent, the UN Security Council will not be able to adopt sanctions. I think we have no doubt to which state it deserves today to be punished with the harshest sanctions in history, but we also know that it will not happen because the state is one of the permanent members. On the contrary, one of the most recent sanctions regime was established by the UN Security Council in 2017 against actors derailing the peace process in Mali. 
I don't doubt that the situation in Mali is very serious and required taking appropriate steps, but did it more deserve sanctions than Russian, uh, Russia killing civilians in Ukraine? And um, Sorry, just, Doctor, I'm uh, just going to, going to let you uh, briefly conclude and then we have to pass on um, to the next speaker. Uh, yes, I'm sorry for uh, making it that long. And I was just about to say that this is instead of uh, conclusions. So I um, was thinking what would be the shape of some perfect economic sanctions, perfect or at least um, um, good for all states. So I think that they should affect officials who violate uh, certain norms, including head of states, prime ministers, and the entire cabinet, and those who participate in enforcing them. Nevertheless, system of sanctions should also take into account that state officials' resources may be officially owned uh, not by them, but by their families. Uh, in such cases, resources of family members should be also included. Uh, secondly, um, the reason for introducing the sanctions should be violations of human rights and international crimes. I think uh, that the term violation of international law is too broad and uh, potentially abusive uh, to be used in this context. Uh, the measures should be, for instance, asset trees, travel ban, lifetime compensation of property. Uh, decisions about sanctions should be undertaken by organs in which all votes are equal and all states are represented, like the UN General Assembly. Obviously, they cannot affect civilians in any way, and there should be a prohibition of introduction of a trade embargo on all goods. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry for making that, that long. Thank you, doctor. Um, that was really interesting and, and gave us a, a perspective on enforcement in international law, which you know is a perennial debate. Um, next, we will hear from Zhao Mao, a DPhil candidate at the University of Oxford and a judicial fellow at the International Court of Justice. Zhao will discuss her paper on the role of procedural rules in international courts and tribunals in promoting global governance goals, an analytical framework. Zhao, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to present at this conference and thank you, for Melina, for introducing me and my uh, topic. So the topic I'm going to present today is the role of procedures in international courts and tribunals in promoting global governance goals and analytical framework. It is generally accepted that the way and degree international courts and tribunals can contribute to global governance depends in part on their procedural rules. In this regard, different international courts and tribunals may contribute to global governance goals in different degrees because of their different procedural arrangement. In my paper, I try to draw on comparative domestic law literature and materials to build an analytical framework they can be used to analyze and compare the procedural rules of different international courts and tribunals. The analytical framework will be useful for us to think of how to develop procedural rules that can better contribute to global governance goals. I argue that the procedures that each international court and tribunal shall adopt should correspond to their functions. I propose to view the functions of international courts and tribunals through a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is the courts and tribunals playing dispute settlement functions, while at the other end, international courts and tribunals can play a more proactive role in promoting common values shared by the international community, thereby contributing to global governance, such as putting an end to impunity, of international crimes by international criminal courts and tribunals, promoting trade liberalization by WTO dispute settlement mechanism, protecting human rights by regional human rights courts. I use the term value implementation to describe such a kind of function. Such a way of analyzing the function and procedural rules is inspired by comparative domestic law literature and I will show that such a distinction between dispute settlement function and value implementation function can also be found in international courts and tribunals. So the analysis will be useful for us to identify what kind of procedures are more suitable for value implementation procedures and what kind of procedures will be more useful for uh, dispute settlement procedures. In my presentation, I will first present the two models of judicial function deriving from comparative domestic law literature, and will show that it can be extended to understand international law and international community. Next, I will introduce the characteristics 
of the procedures corresponding to dispute settlement proceedings and demonstrate their existence in international courts and tribunals. Then I will introduce the characteristics of proceedings corresponding to value implementation function and argue that these procedural characteristics are more suitable for promoting global governance goals by international courts and tribunals. Okay, let's start with the comparative domestic law literature and their relevance to international law. In domestic law context, the functions of judicial proceedings are closely related to the nature of the state and the state law. The nature of states, by virtue of the degree of their involvement in the individual affairs of their citizens, can be described by a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is what I call reactive states, and at the other end of the spectrum is what I call activist states. A purely reactive state builds a supportive framework for its citizens to pursue their respective goals chosen by themselves and encourage them to regulate their interrelationship by themselves through, for example, contracts, agreements. In such a state, it is hard to identify the values and goals of the state that is separate from that of their individuals. The major kind of law governing the relationship between individuals is use dispositiva, which are essentially hypothetical or modal contracts reflecting the custom or social expectations among individuals, but can be contracted out by the real consent of the individuals. In such a state, the role of the government is to maintain basic order and to provide for a forum to solve disputes that individuals cannot settle by themselves. It follows that the major function of courts in such a state is to settle disputes. By contrast, a purely activist state is capable of identifying common values and goals of the state and expect citizens to be united to fulfill the values and goals set out by the state. The epistemology here is optimism in the sense that it is possible to identify common goals worthy of pursuing for by all members of the community. The nature of law legislated by the state is use kogans, which are universal and promontory in nature and cannot be contracted out by the will of individuals. The role of state government here is not merely a dispute settler, but a manager of the joint pursuit of the state. It follows that the role of courts in such a state is to implement the values of the state and to ensure the compliance with the state law by the individuals. So none of the pure forms of this reactive state or active state exist in reality. But you can see that different combinations of these pure forms can exist um, in different states that actually exist in reality. It could be seen that some states in the world are more similar to reactive states, such as Anglo-American um, common law countries, while some states like China is more, are more similar to value implementation states, while some other states could be put in the middle, such as continental European states. Then, then I'm going to argue that the features of reactive states and active states can be found in international law and in international community. Therefore, by analogy, we can also use the dispute settlement and value implementation models to analyze the procedural rules of international courts and tribunals. He I made another form to demonstrate the features of international community that are corresponding to reactive state and activist state. To a large extent, many reactive features exist in positivist international law and international community, but we can also find that the development of international law, especially in the past 100 years, have demonstrated more and more features that are similar to an activist state. Let me start with the reactive features in international law. Sovereign states in international law are comparable to the autonomous individuals that I described in a reactive state because states are sovereigns and there are no higher authorities above them. So it is expected that they could regulate their affairs by themselves and their regulatory autonomy should not be restricted 
A thinking of skepticism also exists in international law. This is manifested in particular in the works of the critical approaches to international law. For example, the work of Marty Koskinami, who argues that the um, international legal argumentation is inherently indeterminate because of the lack of um, common values shared by the international community as a whole. As for the nature of international law, we can see that many rules are use dispositive. Um, both treaties and customary international law are manifestation of state consent. The general international law can be contracted out by the specific consent of the states through treaties. It follows from these features that the major function of interstate courts and tribunals is to settle disputes between equal sovereign states. As for the features of the international community corresponding to an activist state, I have to admit that the current characteristics of international law and international community are such that it is hard to draw an analogy between activist state and international community because there are many uncertainties as to who should be the members of the international community. Should it only limit it to states or should that extend to all the individuals in the, inter in the world? And what are the ultimate goals of the international community? And there's also a lack of a strong world government to coordinate the joint pursuits. Nonetheless, I argue that the international community has demonstrated some features of an activist state, especially through the idea of global governance goals. And there are some international courts and tribunals that actually play value implementation functions. To begin with, the activist feature of the international community is manifested in the limitation of state regulatory autonomy and in the expansion of international legal personality to cover non-state actors, such as international organizations and individuals. Some optimistic thinking can be identified in international law, although it may be hard to identify common values applicable to all the human beings in the world, it might be possible to identify common values at least within international organizations and within international courts and tribunals playing a with functional specializations, such as international criminal courts and tribunals, WTO dispute settlement mechanisms, human rights courts. In terms of the nature of international law, we can see that international law has developed concepts such as use organs, obligation of governance, and international crimes, which are thought to manifest common values of the international community. Given these similarities, it follows that at least some international courts and tribunals can play value implementation functions. So you see that my analysis demonstrated the usefulness of applying the analytical framework from comparative law literature to international law. By analogy, the procedural rules that correspond to these two functions um, as addressed in comparative domestic law literature can also be applied to international courts and tribunals. And given that my time is limited, so I will only address these uh, procedural features uh, very briefly. So in dispute settlement proceedings, the following procedural characteristics can be found. First, procedural justice is more important than outcome justice. As I've mentioned, the dominant epistemology in a reactive state is skepticism because there's no objective way to identify what the common values, what the common goals are. So it follows from this epistemology that it is impossible to reach absolute objectivity in judicial outcome. Therefore, guaranteeing procedural justice should be given more weight. Second, procedural rules should have equal impacts on the parties and to protect party autonomy. This also exists in interstate dispute settlement mechanisms in international law as sovereign equality is the fundamental principle of international law. Third, the involvement of the court is preconditioned by the existence of disputes between the parties. The parties have control of the existence and scope of their dispute, the framing of legal questions, the scope of remedies, the process of fact finding, and the propulsion of the proceedings. So such a feature can also exist in interstate dispute settlement proceedings like ICJ, interstate arbitration. Fourth, representation by professional lawyers play a very, very useful role in consolidating self-governance by parties themselves. But similarly, in interstate courts and tribunals, professional lawyers as repeat players have notable impacts on the procedural arrangements and procedural actions. Fifth, 
judicial decision makers should seek to guarantee party equality and autonomy. They should not proactively seek for information or decide issues that parties have not submitted to them. And finally, the dispute settlement proceedings are prone to maintaining stability of decisions because this is to protect the interests of parties by ensuring that an issue which has already been adjudicated in favor of a party will not be argued again. And by contrast, I argue that those international courts and tribunals which play a more active role in promoting global governance goals should adopt a different set of procedural rules. These rules include the following. Let me read. First, the function of legal proceedings is to promote the realization of community values through all aspects of the proceedings, especially through judicial outcome. Second, the parties do not have absolute autonomy in managing their own affairs. Third, the existence of a dispute between parties is not the precondition for the existence of jurisdiction of the courts in value implementation proceedings. Fourth, legal counsels are not merely representatives of private interests of the parties, but they assist the parties for the purpose of realizing the community values. Fifth, judicial decision makers should seek to ensure the realization of the systematic values through active, through accurate and objective outcome of the cases. And finally, stability of judicial decisions does not have an inherent value. A system of hierarchically, uh, hierarchical remedies is needed to correct substantively wrong decisions. So as illustrated in my presentation, the dispute settlement function and value implementation function of judicial decision-making process have implications on many aspects of procedural rules. For international courts and tribunals aiming to promote global governance goals, their procedural rules should assimilate more characteristics of value implementation proceedings. So this brings uh, my presentation to the end and I'm looking forward to any comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao. That was very well argued and, and provided an interesting analysis um, of the role of procedural rules in international courts and tribunals and the importance of procedural justice. Um, finally, we will now turn to Sarthak Roy, a human rights specialist at Richmond International SA. Um, Sarthak holds an LLM in international law from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. He will discuss his paper, Commissions as Bulwarks Against Impunity. You have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just share my screen. I hope my screen is visible. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. You can maybe put it on the presentation function if, if you're able to do that. Yes, I just did it. Is, is it fine? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the conference organizers for selecting my paper and letting me be part of this fantastic panel of speakers. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the discussions uh, so far and the presentations. Just a caveat, uh, this uh, presentation is uh, from my academic perspective and do not reflect those uh, of the organizations that I'm part of or have been part of previously. In times of war, laws fall silent. This famous maxim by Cicero is often used to illustrate the lack of power of law in the face of conquest and occupation. Global governance mechanisms and architectures are said to be fragmented. Yet, as has been said by Mark Twain about Richard Wagner's music, the situation may not be as bad as it seems. The haunting pictures present in this slide encapsulates the four great humanitarian tragedies of our times, namely, Ukraine, Syria, Afghanistan, and Myanmar. Yet there is a common thread that binds them all in their quest for accountability and justice, the presence of the establishment or of a commission of inquiry. Commissions of inquiry have proliferated on the international plane and have made headlines across pages of newspapers and other media. However, unlike various international courts and tribunals or UN special mandate holders, commissions of inquiry have sadly not captured the attention of academics to a great extent. Yet, Daku Akande poignantly observes that in the absence of a universal compulsory jurisdiction by international judicial bodies, these commissions of inquiry 
are a way in which the international community can obtain an authoritative determination of whether violations have taken place and who are responsible. In that light, when I was producing through the mandates of various commissions of inquiry, these are the four critical features which stood out. First, that they are ad hoc and temporary. Second, they are engaged with questions uh, about international law. Third, established by states or international organizations, primarily the UN. And finally, uh, their findings and conclusions are not binding. To pass the skepticism that commissions of inquiry are just a tool for multilateral diplomacy, I wanted to ex further explore its critical role as a tool for global governance. In that light, my paper strives to answer the following four main questions. First, does that even make a difference if commissions of inquiry are established? Second, are they supposed to just be established as self-standing institutional arrangements, or should they also operate at the services of other mechanisms, like the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court, for that matter? Third, do the terms of reference permit only backward-looking accountability, or can they also act as a tool for transitional justice and to solve problems from flaring up once again? And most importantly, do commissions of inquiry contribute to a coherent development of related areas of international law? So as part of my, as, as an outline uh, for this presentation, in attempting to answer some of the questions that I raised in my previous slide, this paper begins by uh, showcasing the evolution of commissions of inquiry throughout the history. In that pursuit of my academic explorations, I observed that from purely fact finding, there is now an accountability turn that is being witnessed in various commissions of inquiry that are being established. And in that regard, I also explored the interplay of various interrelated uh, norms of international law concerning human rights, humanitarian law, and criminal law. And just like any other study is incomplete without any criticisms and drawbacks, I highlight some of it in my penultimate slide before concluding by stating that there is a widespread consciousness that instead of imposed amnesia, atrocities must be addressed, and the existence of commons of inquiry provides a contagion of accountability against atrocities. So unlike proper, to bust the popular myth that commissions of inquiry are a very new creation, it is not the same. It has been there for a long time right now. And this can be divided into three phases. In the first phase, it was first established in the aftermath of the Gulf of Maine explosion, when Frederick Mertens, uh, who propounded the famous Mertens Clause, was played a critical role in establishing a commission of inquiry. Russia currently is under, under the limelight for its aggression in Ukraine, yet Russian Tsar Nicholas it himself organized the 1899 and 1907 Hague Peace Conferences. And as part of the Hague Convention on Pacific Settlement of Disputes, commissions of inquiry was also a, one of the mechanisms present. In the second phase, commissions of inquiry were primarily established to investigate a wide range of particular attacks uh, during a volatile period of global politics, culminating with the creation of the League of Nations. Uh, for the international lawyers present here, Kubansha inquiry was the first time when a, a commissions of inquiry included a lawyer amongst its members and it investigated the cause of sinking of a Dutch vessel. Afterwards, various commissions of inquiry were also established on the League of Nations pursuant to Articles 11, 12, 15, and 17. Finally, in this contemporary times, the first such instance of commissions of inquiry was the UN War Crimes Commission, which had amongst its members famous international lawyers like René Gasson and as well as Wellington Co. And it had three uh, bodies or frameworks within it. In contemporary times, pursuant to Article 24 of the UN Charter, the UN Security Council is also in, uh, entrusted with investigative powers. However, unlike the UNSC, the UNGA has not been vested with express powers to investigate. Yet, subject to Article 12 of the UN Charter, the UNGA can establish fact-finding bodies pursuant to Articles 10, 11, 14, and 22. Similarly, the UN Human Rights Council, through its implied powers, can also establish several commissions of inquiry, as can the UN Secretary General himself. Christine Chenkin had succinctly observed that the principal idea underlying human rights inquiries is that exposure may contribute to better compliance. Therefore, as Frederick, Federica de Alessandra highlights, lately commissions of inquiry have witnessed a proverbial accountability turn in its mandates and mechanisms. So some of the common features of the modern accountability turn that we are seeing in the mandates of uh, commissions of inquiry 
and which was also present in the recent Ukraine Commission of Inquiry that has been established are fourfold. First, it is tasked with investigation and establishment of facts. Second, there is a legal examination of relevant facts. Third, there is collection and storage of evidence for prospective criminal trial. And finally, there are various recommendations made to several stakeholders. So throughout the last decade and a half, we see that commissions of inquiry have made explicit or implicit references to international humanitarian norms, human rights, or criminal law norms. If one is to introspect from the analysis presented so far in my presentation, it can be concluded that although commissions of inquiry in contemporary times extensively apply law to facts, these mechanisms do not create binding legal obligations. Moreover, them being not a code of law, cannot create legal liabilities or have legal effects. Instead, the, com the commission of inquiry's usage of language of international law helps in bolstering the objectivity of facts and helps in creating a knock-on effects at the political front. Therefore, irrespective of the blooding of fact law distinction, the flexibility provided in terms of reference of commissions of inquiry allows it to not just address backward looking issues of accountability, but also facilitates them to address long-standing issues from flaring up in the future again. Now, there are obviously several criticisms which are also associated with commissions of inquiry as a, uh, in, as a tool for institutional uh, global governance mechanism. First and foremost, there's a huge problem about standard of proof, which many states have, uh, have already reiterated. Due to the flexibility provided by commissions of inquiry, they have a lower evidentiary threshold and uh, for example, in the UNHRC mandated commissions of inquiry on the Israeli flotilla raid of 2010, it's, it simply stated that the mission found the facts set out below to have been established to its mere satisfaction. However, in recent years, there has been course correction undertaken with the standard of proof being that of reasonable grounds to believe standards, which is also uh, similar to those of various international courts and tribunals. Second problem is that of premature determination of accountability through various dubious testimonies and NGOs, which many states attach with those of commissions of inquiry. So that's also a, a problem which uh, commissions of inquiry have to tackle with. Thirdly, there is also an issue of focus being only on one part. For example, in the Richard Goldstone report on uh, Operation Cast Lead, led by Israel, the focus was only on violations by Israel, which had, uh, had a, which faced a lot of criticisms uh, for that matter from states uh, aligned with Israel for that matter. And finally, there is an overwhelming burden of um, commissions of inquiry being set up by the UN Human Rights Council lately, and not so much by the UN Security Council or the UNGA. And therefore the UNHRC is failing in its systemic design as well with the establishment of so many commissions of inquiry. And this burden is not being shifted. However, this can all be, it can all be um, resolved if, uh, if various commissions of inquiry follow this OHCHR guidelines on guidance and practices uh, relating their workings on international law norms and how they can better acquaint themselves. So that's something which uh, various uh, courts and tribunals have also reiterated. So in, in, in conclusion, uh, considering my time is running out, I, I realized, so in his uh, landmark agenda for peace, uh, the then Secretary General, Butros Butros Ghali, had emphasized the importance of fact finding as a tool for preventive diplomacy. Commission, the workings of commissions of inquiry have also strengthened advocacy campaigns for various NGOs and civil society organizations who, have, who highlight a lot of atrocities which are not open, which are hidden from, uh, from the normal discourse. It is also well known that from acts of humanity, seeds of reconciliation and shared sense of humanity emerges. Remembrance and acknowledgement of historic crimes coming clean with the past is essential for the process of reconciliation. Commissions of inquiry have thus provided a step towards that direction by providing recommendations for the future resolution of disputes. And most importantly, in current times, the famous landmark Gambia case, a snapshot of which I presented in this uh, slide, also depended a lot on the findings of the commissions of inquiry on Myanmar for that matter, and therefore creating a great uh, landmark precedence. Even there are talks of a uh, case being brought forth against Syria by a number of states on the basis of the findings made by commissions of inquiry. And finally, and most importantly, on the contribution of commissions of inquiry towards the coherent development of international law. I'll just give two examples before concluding. 
First, the Bassoni Commission, which was established by the UNSC, the aftermath of the wars in Yugoslavia, facilitated the recognition of sexual crimes, not just as war crimes, but also as a method and means of warfare when committed in a systematic manner. And now recently, in the South Sudan Commission, which was chaired by Professor Andrew Clapham, and who happened to be one of my guides here at the Graduate Institute, it was found that starvation as a means and method of war crime is also very much prevalent. While previous scholarly works focused primarily on the interactions between civil and political rights in their interrelated IHL rules, this report made a consequential jurisprudential contribution towards the interactions between ESCR obligations alongside IHL provisions. Therefore, in conclusion, it can be observed that commissions of inquiry encompassing a wide range of bodies have mushroomed across the international legal and political landscape. And from just merely fact-finding missions, commissions of inquiry in more, more contemporary times have witnessed institutional normative tectonic shifts in a world besieged by great power competitions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarathak. That was uh, very insightful. Um, I would now like to turn to uh, the discussion part of the panel and open the floor to our panelists uh, who may have questions uh, for the other panelists or would like to make a comment on a paper that guides or complements uh, their own research. All the papers discussed are works in progress. So in the spirit of academic discussion, I'm sure we would all love to get your thoughts on your fellow academics uh, work in progress, works in progress. Uh, perhaps we can start with Nina. Nina, um, you have around three minutes. Thank you so much. Um, what really struck me um, about especially two of the other presentations we've just heard is how this idea of um, values, um, whether it being many different ones as uh, Xiao was mentioned, but also a value of just human rights as we've heard from Dr. Agata, um, how we have these idealistic views of these different values, but then if we try and put them into practice, it doesn't necessarily fit this idea any longer. And it doesn't really work. Like the idea of Navy in Edom, um, it's definitely a value that should be um, established in practice as well. But then we have these, these other players, especially states, and we're looking at um, sovereignty and state autonomy. Um, and they just affect these values um, negatively. So really we have to kind of see how can we align reality with these idealistic values so that we, we can find a balance um, between the two. Um, and I, I think what really plays into it is how the power between different states is really different. Um, and I, I think that also plays into the reactive and activist um, states and, and how that really um, yeah plays out, but then also in terms of um, of what Agatha said, we have the power, the more powerful states versus the weaker states, and how that actually affects sanctions. Um, and I, I think those are all really interesting ideas that definitely need to be explored further, um, so that we can actually have a good impact on implementing these ideas in practice. Um, Agatha, would you like to perhaps provide a response or comment on that or feel free to you know, give any opinion? Uh, well, thank you very much for this um, for this comment. Um, I uh, I am happy that you enjoyed my presentation, and actually, your presentation was also very close to to, to my research, and I was really listening to it with um, with uh, great attention. And um, uh, actually, I would have a question uh, to Miss Herzog. Can I pose it now? Uh, so um, I wanted to ask about um, the card, another card or from paragraph 20 of the ICC statute or um, uh, uh, domestic cards, as you mentioned, uh, because I was wondering, uh, in Edem, uh, I understand that it works uh, even if there was the sentence of a domestic card. Um, so now the ICC cannot have jurisdiction anymore because of the uh, Nebusin Edem. But um, 
is uh, the ICC uh, case law uh, indicative when it comes to some definition or features of what this another card might be? Because I can imagine that there may be some uh, organs uh, in some states which are um, hardly recognizable as cards as having this judicial function, but they may also issue some kind of um, decisions which would have a punitive character against a person. And if it doesn't count then like uh, as a, another card in the context of Article 20 of the ICC state, it, then it would mean that the Nabisim it doesn't work actually, in fact. So I was wondering whether you have any ideas and comments about it. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so actually there's no real definition of another card and that's actually quite problematic. Um, and there's there's some debate on what should be um, another card because we might have non-state actors. Um, it's not quite clear if other international cards are actually falling under this another card um, scenario. Um, but also, what about uh, situations where the, the government might not be really established, but they still have some type of non-state court um, going on? Um, so that's, that's not quite clear. So we're lacking this, this definition, um, and that's definitely having a negative effect on the Navy's and Eden principle. Because if we can't even really set out, okay, what is another card, then how can we find out if the Navis and Eden principle um, is being negatively affected or not? Obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to <clears throat> proceed with uh, their comments? Pushkar, maybe? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, in fact, uh, while listening to the presentation, uh, we, we, Daniel and I had an internal discussion on this as well. This is regarding relaxation of the rules of procedure before the international courts and tribunals, which Ms. Mao was explaining further. Now, in this regard, if I may ask my question to Ms. Mao, uh, how, how do you perceive uh, relaxation of rules on, let's say, permitting non-disputing parties? to come before the court because the ICJ directly permits for it, but this is not the same case in commercial setting, let's say in commercial arbitration. So where do you strike a balance between the public international law and the private international law in terms of actual application of principles in courts? Oh, thank, thank you. This is a great, great question. But I'm personally, I don't have much experience in commercial arbitration. But in, in terms of the ICJ, I personally think that the major function is dispute settlement. And it follows from this function that the role of third parties, uh, like other states, like experts, like amicus curia, should be uh, restricted unless there's consent of the parties, because the major, uh, major uh, function is to settle disputes between the parties. So the parties should have a, a autonomy. However, I, I would argue that it maybe a change could be seen in the recent development of international law, especially, for example, the current Gambia versus, uh, versus Myanmar case, where a non-injured state could bring a case against a state uh, which allegedly commit genocide in order to implement the values of the international community as a whole. So in such a case, it seems that the states, like any other states, which is a party to the genocide committee could also bring a case, could also join the proceedings because they have the same interest with Gambia. All of us, uh, all of other states are are non interest states, but anyone could have a perhaps who could have an interest on the gen the genocide co convention. So you can see that perhaps there may be some changes in the development of international law, which should have impacts on the role of third parties in the proceedings. And perhaps this a logic could also apply to maybe investor state arbitration, but I'm not an expert. So maybe you could give me the uh, some examples. So sure, thank you very much. Uh, just building on that, while we were writing the paper on security for cost, we noticed in investor state disputes, um, civil societies come before the tribunals and say, hey, look, I have an application to make. And this completely disrupts the whole proceedings, the timetable of uh, hearings, which has already been scheduled. 
Now, for all these things, I think what you suggested, like how ICGA has model law or model principles, I think based on those things is something that even the international tribunals, especially investor state dispute tribunals, could mirror the structure uh, in, in, in following for a better governance model. But I'm not sure if the same would apply for a commercial setting, but uh, thank, thanks for uh, your thought-provoking question. Thank you. Thank you. Very thought-provoking. Thank you. Sarathak, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. So I had a question and more like an observation on uh, Dr. Agatha's presentation that it, it appears that some global companies are going beyond state required action and imposing sanctions themselves. For example, some global corporations are going beyond state requirements to disengage from Russia in a way that is are almost tantamount to imposing their own sanctions and sometimes using international norms when justifying their actions. In this respect, do you think that private actors are not just operating as conduit for enforcement of international norms, but as sites of political influence and powers in their own right? Thank you very much for this question. I think it's very important. And actually, I have been thinking about this recently because the case of Russia shows that even though the sanctions are targeted against the state officials, the um, regular people, the regular Russians will also suffer because of it, because there's so many Western companies withdrawing from Russia that actually everybody will feel somehow the impact of sanctions. So this is highly important. Uh, well, it's often, I think, the case that um, some uh, huge uh, worldwide companies uh, are nevertheless tied with um, uh, politically and geopolitically with some region, with a state of its origin, and they uh, would like to pursue um, uh, also um, the uh, similar policy goals that the state of the origin uh, do. So uh, it's also, um, I don't think, uh, uh, it has much to do with enforcing international law actually by them, but I think it really has a lot to do with pol politics and with the um, maybe image in front of the consumers uh, of the state of origin, because if the uh, state introduces sanctions, it will be hard for them uh, to uh, stay on the side and uh, do not react uh, in case, uh, especially uh, of such major human rights violations and international crimes. So I think it's uh, also a matter of politics, of geopolitics, of uh, a little bit PR, I'm sure, uh, but uh, I guess it's indispensable for them to sustain their their brands and their um, high high value uh, in the um, in the view of uh, customers. So um, so I I think it's 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 not about really implementing uh, international law. Would anyone like to make a follow up comment on that, or Shama, perhaps you could give us your comments in general? Um, my, my general comment is that I feel that I personally benefited a lot from uh, our colleagues presentation today because I feel that um, that the materials provided by everyone are all very useful for me to reflect my analytical framework. For example, Ms. Nina Hegel's, Hegel's thesis on positive complementarity and Ms. Indem uh, provides useful materials for reflecting the function of international criminal courts and tribunals. And I realized that maybe there's a tension of the function of the ICC because there's a tension of the values between uh, respecting sovereign equal, uh, sovereignty and also uh, 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 protecting human rights. So when they conflict with each other, which one should be given um, priorities? I'm, I'm still very puzzled. Um, and uh, for Mr. Pushka's presentation, um, and it seems that uh, your presentation also provides very useful materials for me to reflect about the function of investor state uh, arbitration. So like interstate arbitration, I presume that investor state arbitration should also um, focus on settlement of disputes. But your uh, presentation uh, demonstrates that actually there are some other goals, public goals that should be pursued by ISDS like uh, uh, protecting investment, like uh, contribute to the uh, development of the economy of the states. And these goals could uh, definitely influence uh, the reforms 
uh, like what you've discussed, the cost and also uh, the standards of independence and impartiality. If we only focus on the dispute settlement function, then the then we should focus on the perspective of the parties. But if we look at the broader values and goals, then the standard of impartiality should be based on the perspective of the public. The purpose should be maintain the, the co public confidence in the proceedings. Um, and, and definitely the, uh, the, this, uh, the value implementation functions will also have implications on other procedures. And uh, Dr. Agata's presentation on sanctions and also very thought provoking for me. And I feel that my analytical framework might also be useful um, because I feel that um, for uh, uh, the, the effective of sanctions might also depend on whether common values and goals could be identified um, before individual states take their actions of sanction. And uh, it also it should also depend on whether there exists central authority to coordinate the joint pursuits, such as through the uh, resolution of the UK UN Security Council. And I feel that all your conclusions uh, fit very well with my uh, framework of value implementation. <laughs> and finally, uh, Mr. Sasakaro's presentation of the Commission of Inquiry. I, I feel also that, uh, that it seems that it, it also plays a value implementation function because first the, the decision of the Commission of Inquiry is not binding because it does not aim at settle merely disputes between the parties, but is used as materials um, to, um, to demonstrate the facts to the international community in a more independent and objective way. And in order to promote the value implementation functions more effectively, uh, the COIs should not just operate as a standalone institution, but should uh, coordinate with some other institutions like international courts and tribunals in order to effectively ensure the compliance with international law. So I, I feel that everyone's materials are so helpful for me. So th thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Val. That was such a nice way you just brought everything together. Um, so if anyone doesn't have any, does anyone have any further comments or we can just uh, jump straight to the questions. Daniela, I, I don't know, I forgot, I forgot about you. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, I was really impressed by all the presentations, but with what have, everything is happening now with Russia and all the comments related with the ISDS and all the potential um, investor claims related to sanctions, um, I, I was very fun focused on um, Dr. Agata's presentation uh, because I think that will have also an impact on, on what me and, and Pushkar we were researching. Um, and I, I wouldn't agree with Sartak, sorry, um, about the fact that we have uh, corporations applying their own law, but uh, it's, as Dr. Agata said, a reaction to politics and looking from a commercial perspective, uh, I think the, the reaction to a private party when you have sanctions in a respective country is to, to withdraw. But the, the reaction of the international community, especially of the investment community to these sanctions is not very positive. And the counter reaction, the retaliation coming from Russia is even more, uh, more offensive. So I think um, there will be an interesting development in the years to come. Um, of the ISDS and of UN Central uh, Working Group. Um, and I think that is to be still followed because the ISDS, uh, it's still a, a mechanism in, in development and still learns a lot, uh, especially for the amicus courier, learns a lot from the, from the ICJ and from the, well, WTO, which is not functioning anymore these days. So thank you very much to, to all of you for, for the magnificent presentations. Well, thank you to everyone for this discussion. Um, I'm now going to read a few questions and um, if anyone wants to answer them, feel free to answer them, but um, some of them may be a bit directed um, and more specific to uh, one of the panelists. So I might just you know, name a panelist and whoever wants to speak later on, please go ahead. Um, so we have a question, uh, well, two questions which are related. Uh, perhaps for Nina, uh, one is from Rahul Mohanty, who asks, um, in applying the principle of ne bis in idem, does the ICC do a review of the criminal code and procedure of the state in question or judicial due process? 
For instance, if the judicial system of a state does not guarantee due process rights or has evidentiary standards that are radically different uh, from those of the ICC, would their acquittal of an accused preclude an investigation and prosecution before the ICC? And the second related question uh, from Vinicius Barros, if the ICC grants permission for a state to continue an investigation, do you believe that the state is limited by nebis and idem as designated as designed in the ICC statute or by its domestic legislation? Or should the state combine both international and national norms? Um, Nina, what do you think? Thank you very much. Um, so generally the ICC does not review uh, domestic due process guarantees. Um, in fact, the ICC in one of the judgments has said that it's not an international court of human rights, which sits in judgment over domestic proceedings. Uh, personally, I find this quite problematic because on the other hand, the ICC does actually judge domestic proceedings in terms of unwillingness or inability, um, as well as quality um, for, in the example would be sham trials. Um, but. I'm only aware of the ICC asking for a guarantee of capital punishment not being an option as punishment before um, the domestic courts. So I hope that answers the first question by Raul. Um, and then regarding the second question. Um, so it should in the first place be, so, sorry, the domestic proceedings should in the first place be limited um, by the Rome statute. So decisions to prosecute should be made on the basis of previous ICC proceedings. And this is mainly because many states do not have like a horizontal or interstate neighbors in Edom uh, protection. So um, for example, prosecutions following decisions by another state, but also by international courts just aren't regulated by domestic frameworks with a few exceptions, the Netherlands, for example, but generally, um, yeah, there's there's no no real limitation on this. Thank I hope you, that answers the question. Um, so one question for Agatha. Well, two questions, which are again are pretty related. Um, one is from Tanya Sornikova Dragomir of the West University of uh, Timisoara. How would you assess the effectiveness of sanctions in relation to North Korea? And Another related one um, by Mohammed Gobashi is to what extent can the sanction applied against Russia affect the end of the conflict? Um, so yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much for these questions. All of the questions were very interesting. When it comes to the sanctions against uh, North Korea, uh, well, um, I think that uh, they're uh, one of the uh, most prominent examples of ineffective sanctions, actually. Uh, for many reasons. Uh, well, the first one is that um, China um, actually does not comply with the sanctions. And according to the United States, they're not complying at all. So simply North Korea was able to direct all their uh, trade um, uh, needs, uh, all their export and imports to China. And that's how um, it uh, can still have um, a pretty much normally working economy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are some uh, opinions that uh, the sanctions directed against North Korea uh, were uh, wrong when it comes to the undertaking measures, because uh, as long as uh, North Korean authorities have an income, they are able to produce income anyhow, they are able to, or to buy uh, weapons or some uh, elements to, to build weapons or uh, whatever other uh, products uh, are forbidden to be exported to North Korea uh, on the black market. So um, it really doesn't change much. Uh, but also a problem is that um, we are not able to uh, realistically uh, evaluate uh, what is the impact on sanctions on North Korea and what should be these most accurate sanctions uh, imposed on North Korea, because we don't have much data coming from that state. So uh, we can only uh, assume of what we are shown by the uh, regime uh, propaganda. Um, nevertheless, uh, it is also quite um, uh, quite obvious that because of the um, distribution of income and distribution of wealth in North Korea, we can assume that 
uh, despite the sanctions are targeted against the state officials, actually uh, there is uh, there are some elites uh, in the country um, from which the burden of sanctions was uh, taken all, uh, away. And uh, actually the entire burden of sanctions was um, was imposed, was um, redistributed uh, to um, regular people. Uh, which actually suffered the most because of sanctions, while uh, it, it was um, ensured that these elites will still have access to many resources. When it comes to the question about uh, Russia, actually, um, I think that this is a good example of uh, the unarticulated goal of sanctions, because um, we assume that the uh, the aim of sanctions is to um, immediately uh, cease the armed conflict um, because it was vocal uh, made vocal uh, and uh, of course that's that's the ultimate goal but I think that also an important goal of sanctions in, uh, imposed in Russia is that to uh, make realize the Russian society that something very wrong is going on and the uh, Russia is involved and that such sanctions are not imposed just for some minor violations of international law. And this is also to uh, convince Russian people to somehow uh, uh, maybe um, uh, rebel against the uh, existing governments to uh, try to um, uh, to try to introduce some political change uh, in Russia and to, uh, and that's why I, I think that uh, that's the, um, the direct goal of the sanctions and uh, because the, the uh, social pressure uh, potentially could have some impact on the changes uh, uh, in the uh, Russian authorities and maybe even change of the president, but I, I don't think it's in short term possible. Uh, nevertheless, um, I don't think that they will really uh, have impact on the uh, um, on the um, course of the armed conflict itself, but they may have impact in long terms on the um, political scene in Russia. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. I think we'll just wait and see. <laughs> um, so a question for Sarthak by um, Aruna Kol. Uh, two questions, actually, uh, excuse me. What is the advantage of commissions of inquiry where there already exists independent mechanisms, such as in Syria, Myanmar, et cetera? Can't the functions of these bodies be carried out by a single institution, um, thereby saving uh, financial resources? And the second question is how useful are these commissions for countries against whom there do, there do not seem to be any trials or cases in the foreseeable future? Um, because the data will be collected, um, the data collected will, might change over time. So how helpful um, can that be? Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, first, for the first question, yes, it's, it's definitely an issue when there are too many commissions of inquiry on, uh, on, on one specific uh, context or a conflict context, because then since there are flexibilities provided, so there might be some kind of fragmentation of international law issues that might come through or in terms of the issues of uh, evidence gathering and uh, accountability processes. So I definitely do acknowledge the fact that commissions of inquiries, when it's mushrooming too large, you know, then it becomes too big to fail sort of a thing. So that's something which one has to definitely, the international community of states needs to keep into context that there needs to be one specific tailor-made commission of inquiry in terms of obtaining various kinds of evidence and finding processes and pathways for accountability. As for the second question, so this stems from the view of international law. If you are looking at international law only that of strict compliance, then obviously there's a problem. But if international law is that of an argumentative practice, which Monica Hakimi also mentions, then the role of international law uh, and commissions of inquiry is very critical because this whole aspect of naming and shaming can also bring forward some kind of compliance in, in, in the processes. And that's what I had mentioned uh, as to what Kristen Chinkin also had had reiterated that despite it not being foolproof, the fact that this processes and this naming and shaming that happens right now in a, in a globalized society, states are nudged towards trying to comply with those obligations. So for example, it so happened like obviously, thanks to the case being brought forth by Gambia for the ICJ, uh, the measures that were recommended by the commissions of inquiry on Myanmar regarding Rohingya to a large extent was also being complied so it has been observed, but 
definitely there is a need for study in terms of compliance with commissions of inquiry um, um, results and reports, which I think uh, the International Academy need to needs to undertake to better understand the workings of commissions of inquiry and its usefulness. Thank you um, for your answer. Um, and we have a question for uh, Pushkar and Daniela uh, from Andrew Ku. Some corporations are wealthier and more economically and politically powerful than nation states. They make huge investments in countries and have a huge impact on the politics, economy, uh, and environment of nation states. Should they continue to be confined to the, to, to the traditional separation between public international and private international law? Or should there be a different set of rules that need to be drafted to apply them? What do you think? So, um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a complex um, answer. And the thing is, since the adjudication system in at least investor state dispute settlement is not as stable as the ICJ, uh, it's formed of uh, ad hoc arbitral tribunals we indeed had exit, which now changed the rules. And there is the working um, group from, from UNCITRAL trying to establish um, harmonious guidelines for adjudication adjudicators. Um, it is still, in my opinion, quite early to say that we can have a set of standalone rules. We can aim for recommendations but the problem would be what happens if they are not respected um, that's one thing and the other thing that some corporations are more powerful than than some countries i think there is it depends how you how you see the the, the problem because at the end of the day a state is still a sovereign and it's still an entity which has more leverage uh, in, in, both in an international law, public international law setting and private international law setting than a corporation which today exists and tomorrow may go bankrupt because of sanctions. So, and I leave it also to Pushkar to give his opinions about it. Uh, just to briefly uh, supplement uh, what uh, Daniela just said. Uh, now, if you just take the example of Meta, or in the case of Shell or ExxonMobil, in the case of uh, oil and natural gas. Now, these corporations are, are quite large and uh, humongous than few island states. Now, when, just imagine a case where these companies are investing in, in a small island state somewhere in Asia Pacific. Now, the whole dynamics of a dispute settlement is shifted towards when the adjudicators are looking at it from the perspective of how best they could resolve the problem. So I still think that there is a shift towards uh, favoritism for the investors. But if you see what Daniela said, where I, I kind of disagree with her, though we're writing on the same topic, uh, you can't really have a uniform system. And if you want to have a uniform system of rules, then perhaps uh, there should be more stringent due diligence even before the company starts. Now, once the company is already incorporated, it's, it's quite hard to break them down. So thank you for that. Um, and perhaps just one last question we can squeeze in, um, which is a big one. Uh, perhaps Jao Mao, you can help with this one. Um, from Shmuel Yerushalmi from Israel and Joseph Aliou of Freetown, Sierra Leone, who had similar questions. Um, they questioned the credibility and reliability of international courts in bringing to justice, justice you know, the Western powers. Um, as compared to you know, African warlo warlords that, that were brought to justice before the ICC. Um, what can you say with regards to this? And maybe can this, you know, plug, uh, can this gap be plugged um, in terms of procedural justice or what is your opinion? I mean, oh, I put you on the spot. You could, anyone else could please feel free to answer. <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm not an ICC expert. Can, can I choose another question? I, I realize that it seems there's an ICJ question. Can I answer that one? <laughs> Some people ask, ask what are the effective means of resolving disputes before the ICJ? Can I choose that one? Sure, because I don't really know much about ICC. Okay, I'll answer this. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 
I'll answer this ICJ question. The, um, so yes, indeed, the major function of the ICJ is to settle disputes as is uh, stipulated in Article 38 of the ICJ statute. So if you have a look of the procedural rules of the ICJ, uh, you can see that many rules are designed to settle the disputes between the parties. For example, the basis of the jurisdiction of the court is consensual. The parties can appoint ad hoc judges. The parties have the power to determine the scope of the dispute, the scope of remedies, the existence of the disputes, and, and they, they push the proceedings uh, forward, and the, and the decision of the uh, court is binding on the parties, and also the court seems to be very passive in terms of fact finding. The judges usually do not ask questions um, during the proceedings, and also you can see that there is there are repeat players of the professional lawyers, which are indeed mainly from uh, the developed countries, Western countries, some people may argue that this is a problem, but actually these features all fit the dispute settlement proceedings. So if, we, if you argue that the major function of the ICJ is merely to settle disputes between the parties, then all of these proceedings are fine. It is also fine to have repeat players, even though they are not dominated by, by lawyers from developed nations. However, you can also argue that the ICJ should play a more active role in promoting values shared by the international community. And this should have implications on the reform of the procedural rules of the ICJ. At the list, the ICJ is an organ of the United Nations. So at the list, in some of the proceedings, like the advisory proceedings, its function is to implement the value of the UN. For example, the value include maintaining peace and security, ensuring compliance with international law as manifested in many advisory cases like Israeli war advisory opinion, which involve violation of use slogans. And also in the uh, recent case, Chagos advisory opinion, it manifested the value of decolonization. So you see that ICJ should, at, at least in some circumstances, play a value implementation function. And even in contentious proceedings, for example, the recent case uh, against Russia, the court very fastly issued a, a provisional measure uh, requesting Russia to stop its military um, actions. So you see this, this effectively restricted the um, uh, regulatory autonomy of individual states. So this is actually a manifestation of the value implementation function. And also I'll just talk about the Gambia uh, versus Myanmar case where a small nation from Africa take a lead to implement the role of, uh, to, to implement the value of the international community as a whole, which is quite praiseworthy. And also we, we could notice that actually these days the court gradually play, it seems like a more active role in fact finding, for example, in the recent delivered case, uh, DRC versus Uganda, the compensation phase, the court um, appointed by itself uh, some experts to assist it uh, in fact finding. So I, it seems that some, some, there, there are some um, changes and reforms which demonstrate that uh, the function of international court tribunal like the ICJ is moving from a merely private dispute settlement function to a function that contribute to global governance goals. This is my response. Thank you, Jamal. That was really interesting. And you managed to touch upon that question as well. So <laughs> that was great. Um, so this marks the end to our panel. Um, thank you to all the speakers for your wonderful presentations um, and to the audience members for their questions. Uh, we're going to break now before the start of panel two on governing the climate and environment. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>